Though the BRI has hit some snags, Andy Mock believes that things are now moving in a positive direction. Jobs is a big issue. People say, well, this isn't creating enough jobs in the African continent. They're not really benefiting from this. What's the story there? Well, I think there's two aspects to this, Mike. So I think first, uh, some countries, African countries, are good at saying, you know, we want local jobs to be a part of any deal. The other is that we need to recognize, too, that it's expensive for a Chinese company to send a Chinese person over to Africa because that's an expat. It's much more expensive. And the Chinese companies I've talked with have said they would love to hire uh, African engineers, African executives, because it's cheaper for them. And they're helping invest training programs to help make that happen. So I think that this is a problem that perhaps in the short term is an issue, but I think we'll also, uh, the incentives are aligned for this problem to be corrected in the long run. During the two sessions, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi was asked about, is this a debt trap? And he had specific examples. He said, you know, in Kenya, you have this rail line that goes from Nairobi to Mombasa. It's created 50,000 jobs. Do they need to get out there and say, look, and, but isn't there also a problem in that when you start these projects, it's not like a light switch going on and off. They're, they're long term, aren't they? And that makes it difficult to say, look, here are the here are the results. You don't know what they are at this stage. No, I think that is a great point. I mean, the first thing we have to recognize that a large part of uh, the Belt and Road uh, involves infrastructure investment, which by definition is very capital intensive, meaning it uses up a lot of money. It takes a long time and it's risky. And that's why historically it's been such a problem. Uh, we look at uh, you know, the US multilateral institutions like the World Bank, they've all struggled with this. And I think that uh, you know, there is uh, somewhat of a political agenda behind a lot of these negative stories that we're seeing. You know, I'm glad you raised this point about the uh, railway between Mombasa and Nairobi, um, because this railway has accelerated the ability of goods to be moved uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi and even points further within Africa all the way through to West Africa. And that's hugely important. But here's the problem. Uh, it's now created bottlenecks at the end point. So these things are not solved in one go. Mm. And it is a step-by-step -step incremental process. Investment in infrastructure has been directly tied to greater economic output, according to the International Monetary Fund and the United States Federal Reserve. Both institutions agree that for every dollar spent on infrastructure, the economic return is threefold. I talked to a colleague from Nairobi who said, you know, it, it's, it's one thing, and clearly she's lived through this experience. The West sends aid and somehow it ends up going here or there, but it doesn't, they don't see tangible results. And she said, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to get your product to market, you know, this rail line, it's, it's, a, it's a deal maker. I mean, it can really help you. Um, and yet I don't think in, in the West people see it that way. I think not yet. I, uh, you know, a wag said this humorously, when words and numbers collide, the numbers win. And I think that exactly here, that there is a lot of, uh, I think, not entirely fair criticism uh, that is quite biased. But the facts, the numbers, I think will prevail in that we see the investment rising, trade rising, jobs being created, uh, and that that is a positive, just like we look at the China story. Uh, Shenzhen, there was enormous skepticism when Shenzhen started. Uh, Pudong, uh, there was a lot of snarky Western media commentary at the time that said, this is this huge white elephant. It's overbuilt. Who could ever do something like this? Who would even want something like this? And look at uh, Pudong today. Yeah, it's a really good point. Let me ask you about um the question that a lot of people ask, because there's all these, these deep suspicions about China. What does China get out of this? Well, you know, I think this phrase, win-win, uh, uh, is, uh, I think, somewhat taken not that seriously in the West. But the issue here, I think, also is that uh, Westerners suffer, or some Westerners, and particularly those, I think, in political leadership positions, suffer from this kind of ideological bigotry that I see is very similar to what we see as the segregationists in the South, that just for various reasons cannot accept something different and you know, reflexively see it as negative. And that 
they, these people, I think, uh, while their views hold a lot of currency today, uh, you know, I think history will show that, uh, that perhaps they were wrong. China does benefit, but so does the African continent, so do the other areas. So, so kind of walk us through what are the payoffs for each of the players, would you say? Well, you know, I think China's goal has been uh, as part of to step back. So, you know, it all starts again in China. The system is quite different from, say, in the U.S. So uh, it's led by the party, so the Communist Party of China with Xi Jinping at the core. So in this way, I think it's important for Westerners to understand how the system works, at least in a more simple, high-level way. So the party sets the direction. The, uh, the term they use is they are the vanguard, so they lead. And the idea here is the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, right, or the Chinese uh, people. And that how is this going to happen? It's through uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era which is quite a mouthful. But I think the point of it here is that there is a vision, there is a strategy that gets translated into detailed plans on the ground. So how does China win from Belt and Road? So one part of this re, uh, rejuvenation of the Chinese nation is to be a part of the global community. And we all know that trade and investment, especially cross-border trade and investment, really has been one of the biggest drivers of global prosperity. And China's commitment to openness and integration is a key part of that. And I think this is where the Belt and Road Initiative fits in. So by creating both the physical infrastructure, but also the soft infrastructure as well, so standards, uh, harmonization of customs, all of these things that are not things you can necessarily touch, like a railway, uh, an airport, a port, uh, but are just as important to reduce the friction uh, of trade and investment and the movement of people across borders. I think that is how China wins and how the rest of the world, especially the countries that actively participate in the Belt and Road Initiative win. China views the Belt and Road as an opportunity to share the lessons it learned from its own development. It was ultimately investment in infrastructure that transformed China from an impoverished agrarian society to the world's second largest GDP. This economic model saw China's GDP grow 60 times in size over just 40 years. This dramatic change lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty, blossoming the world's largest middle class. According to United Nations estimates, China's rise accounts for 80% of global poverty alleviation. China believes that this development model suits the needs of today's globalized world and can help lift other developing nations out of poverty. We've watched these models in the past uh, when it comes to the African continent. We've seen it with the West uh, sending aid and perhaps it just kind of goes in different directions. But one of the keys to this thing is, is skin in the game. Uh, it's a partnership. It's not uh, a handout. Um, how important is that feature of this, do you think? I think it's incredibly important, and that is absolutely the key, because when we look in the past, um, a lot of what we focus just on Africa for the minute, uh, you know, for a minute, that you know, Africa has lagged behind for various reasons, and attempts to remediate this and historically has largely been through aid, and that has not worked out that well. You mentioned skin in the game. I think here, the Chinese approach, which gets negatively portrayed as you know, debt trap diplomacy, I think a more neutral way of describing it is doing this on commercial terms, right? And that if these deals are structured this way, whether it's railway, uh, you know, whether it's a port, whether it's a highway, whether it's investment in power plants, um, that if it's done on a commercially viable basis, uh, that brings uh, benefits for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, the research that they wanted me comment on says that... Uh, Andy describes himself as an ABC, or an American-born Chinese. It is from this vantage point that he compares and contrasts and analyzes China and the United States. Wow, fascinating. So you've got one foot in, in the West, one foot in the East. Uh, so I think you've got a different vantage point. You can look at this through a, a unique lens.
when you think of the United States, you think about the Marshall Plan or Kennedy saying, I'm going to put a man on the moon within the decade. And there's this book by Ben Horowitz called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And those are hard things. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative is a hard thing. But it seems like China's willing to do the hard things, and it seems like it's difficult for the U.S. to do hard things. Is that a fair way of looking at it? I think that is uh, a good way of looking at it, Mike. So, I mean, one part is the actual ability to get things done. The second is the intention. I think this is where political will comes in, in that to go back again to this uh, unifying, organizing principle of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, right? It articulates very clearly what is the goal. Just like John F. Kennedy articulated a very clear goal, we will put a man on the moon within 10 years, right? Uh, that part of the issue now is what is the clear goal of the United States? So President Trump talks about making America great again, but even within his own thinking with this, I think there are some contradictions and some lack of clarity. But then you add in the input of the legislative branch now controlled by the Democratic Party. You look at the different states able to do this. I mean, it would be unimaginable to say the governor of Guangdong province, you know, which is equivalent to California in terms of its importance uh, as a share of GDP to the country, saying, I'm going to do everything I can to oppose what Xi Jinping wants to have done. I mean, so that's more of a, a capabilities issue. But to go back to this uh, political will question, yes, it's, I think it's very, very true that uh, there isn't the political will. And the other thing that, uh, you know, I think Westerners like to criticize in this, uh, I think, ideological bigoted way is that the party emphasizes ideology. And if we look back to the U.S., I mean, what made the U.S. great initially was that it was a relatively homogeneous group of people with a lot of common characteristics, landed white men, right? So they shared a common worldview, common values, and through that were able to work together to accomplish things. So I think with China, the party also recognizes this, and this is why this ideology, why you know, indoctrination, this ideological training perhaps is, is a better word because indoctrination can have a negative connotation. But why the party spends so much effort, uh, and I've had the opportunity to interact with different levels of uh, party organizations, that it's not just talk, they spend a lot of time in study meetings, discussions, and the reason for that is to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And that's, I think, how political will is generated and sustained. It's interesting you have an advisor about China to the U.S. president who wrote the book Death by China. Um, and in Australia, there's a professor by the name of uh, Clive Hamilton. I want to get his name just right. He wrote the book Silent Invasion, China's Influence in Australia. He calls the BRI a Trojan horse. It's basically political and strategic leverage. That's what China's looking for. How do we get past uh, these deep suspicions, or, or is there just no way to get around it? Well, I think, unfortunately, um, when you have a system, so the Anglophone world, it's, you know, for a, a convenient way of thinking about it is the five eyes, right? So the intelligence sharing between the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. But in a way, it's this Anglophone world that has a certain worldview with the U.S. at the center. And primarily uh, following a U.S. Uh, value system uh, paradigm of how the world should be, that it's perhaps, it's unfortunate, but I think it's unavoidable that where the U.S., uh, I think, has this, uh, again, this hegemonic, somewhat bigoted, ideological view of the world, that we cannot, we as Americans, cannot tolerate a system that is different from ours and that anything that has the potential to disprove, discredit our system, meaning that our system is not what everyone in the world should adopt, uh, that that is a threat. And it's unfortunate because even though there is not the intention of being threatening by China, the fact of its existence makes it a threat to the United States. And I think that this is where uh, you know, whether you're 
in the U.S., you're in Australia, or you're somewhere in the middle, say Singapore or Korea or Germany, uh, even though you know these are all American allies, but I think they also see themselves kind of caught in the middle. That without I mean, being forced to choose a side because the U.S. is taking this view. And I think that this is where this idea of a threat comes from. And if you buy into this worldview, in fact, China does pose an existential threat to the United States because the U.S. says our version of human rights, our version of democracy, our version of organizing and running an economy must be the way everyone else does it. And no, one other, no other way can succeed. And yet, here's this uh, example that cannot be ignored. The Belt and Road relies heavily on connectivity. China believes that the future of the service sector lies in the digital Silk Road and internet connectivity. This has seen the BRI make a big push in increasing global internet access across the continents. 70% of Africa's and 30% of the globe's mobile internet is provided by Chinese company Huawei. Mobile transactions over these networks amounted to almost $13 trillion in 2017. Let's talk about the success of the BRI. You've followed this from the get-go. I mean, uh, when, when it was first announced in 2013, it sparked your interest. Give me your vision, if, if everything goes according to plan, how does it reshape things on the world stage? Well, I think it has the potential to profoundly reshape the world for at least decades. Because when we think about the core part of the Belt and Road, it's really about integrating the Eurasian and the African landmass through hard infrastructure, so railways, highways, ports, uh, airports, right? Um, but there's also this digital Silk Road as well that in parallel to this. So that's primarily e-commerce driven, right? So, you know, as an American, I can understand the American policymakers being concerned about this because what this is doing is, you know, we already see the economic and the political center of gravity shifting eastward or, you know, towards Asia. Um, you know, we look at the two biggest economies in the world, China and Japan are in Asia. Um, that this is uh, a fact of life and we can see the Belt and Road accelerating these trends and in some sense uh, marginalizing the U.S. Again, not intentionally, but this is where all the people are. Um, and when we include Africa as well, I think Africa is projected to have more people than China in the next 20 some odd years. That most of the people are here. Most of the wealth is here, whether we look at it in terms of natural resources, uh, economic development, et cetera, et cetera. And that the Belt and Road, I think, is the circulatory system, the nervous system, even the skeletal system that will animate this. So from a transatlantic world to trans-Pacific? I would say uh, trans-Pacific implies the United States and China primarily. Of course, we have Canada and Mexico on the North American continent and Japan, Korea, so we think trans-Pacific. I think actually it becomes really Eurasian, so perhaps uh, less trans-oceanic, mm. but really pan-continental, and pan-continental meaning from Asia through Western Europe, south through Africa, including, of course, the Middle East, Central Asia, that this is really where the action is, and that the Belt and Road, uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is, I think, one, a recognition of this, but also a way to bring it into reality uh, much sooner. And I think this also is worth mentioning, Mike, that this, I think, demonstrates um, that the visionary nature of China's leadership. So this is a plan that will take years, if not decades, to reach complete fruition. But it's also very far-sighted. And I want to maybe go on a little bit of an aside here. But you know, two of the very hot issues today are cybersecurity and uh, terrorism. And we look at what happened in Christchurch uh, with the shootings there, right? And uh, 
we look at cybersecurity, one of the big issues in the United States, you know, since 2016 is the impact of fake news. And, uh, you know, the alleged Russian interference in the presidential election. Uh, and now there's a lot of talk that something needs to be done. And it's a very reactive approach. And yet when we look at China, in the early days of social media, the Chinese recognized that this has the potential for profoundly destabilizing impact on uh, society and said, you know, this needs to be managed. And at the time, the Americans the, from the president, I think it was uh, President Clinton uh, at the time, to other sectors of society saying, you know, that shows how backwards and on the wrong side of history the Chinese are. Don't they know that the internet cannot and should not be censored? And what does Facebook do today? They hire hundreds, if not thousands, of curators. And what is curation other than censorship, right? So I think that China's always been ahead of the curve on the issues that really matter. Um, the, you know, if we look at terrorism, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So look at these white uh, supremacist lone wolf uh, terrorists, right? These are, again, some of it stems from hate speech online. And we see China also recognizing this, but being very proactive and saying, you know, we need to educate people or perhaps re-educate people. We need to make sure this is managed before it explodes into a problem. And I think that's starting to catch on in the United States. Like we see now, I've seen uh, some discussion that uh, organizations in the U.S. saying, you know who's the best at managing online content? China. <laughs> and maybe we can learn something from them. So I had some cause for optimism. Another aspect of the Belt and Road is bringing development to areas traditionally considered too risky for investment. China argues that bringing economic opportunities to fragile areas will reduce poverty and bring stability. A United Nations report cites poverty as a major driver for violent movements in the world, including terrorism. Some of these projects are not easy. I think of Baluchistan, which is a dangerous area of Pakistan. China's kind of going in and doing stuff that others would probably shy away from. Is there a danger there? And what are your thoughts about that aspect of the BRI? Absolutely. Now, again, this has never been done. Um, first, the absolute magnitude of, I mean, the amounts of money involved is, uh, you know, historic. But also, when we think about uh, the range of languages, cultures, uh, different histories that are encompassed from the more Confucian, so, you know, from Korea, uh, Japan, going westward, so Central Asia, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, all the way through to Western Europe to more of a Judeo-Christian uh, heritage uh, set of countries. There are enormous, enormous problems that need to be addressed. And I think that, and we're seeing this as well, that um, China's learning as it goes. And first, it's being, uh, I think it's inevitable that it will get involved in some of these local, regional conflicts, um, but also different sectors of society as well. So in some countries, uh, there's been a lot of pushback, criticism that only the elites are benefiting. And this is exploiting, uh, you know, the, the common people. So I think that these are all very, very complex issues. But I think one thing that um, China and the party has shown is that it is extremely adaptive and extremely resilient. So. Um, who can say whether it will ultimately be successful? But if we look at the track record of how China has addressed, really since 49, uh, gargantuan domestic and external challenges and has succeeded beyond the wildest imagination of really anybody, I think there is some cause for optimism. Terrific. Thanks so much.